Thank you, Giorgio. If I may, I will, I will uh, uh, start the session today, the second day of the days dedicated to the green chemistry that we are organizing as a, as a group of the uh, Italian Chemical Society, uh, as a the group of green chemistry for the Italian Chemical Society. So first of all, I want to thank, of course, all the members of the group, because uh, uh, especially actually, I will say Giorgio, who is giving a very active uh, contribution to make these, uh, uh, these from the operational point of view, from the, this virtual meeting uh, effective. So we are uh, uh, we are uh, streaming the presentations uh, via Facebook uh, via the, the Facebook page of the group and also via, via YouTube. So uh, I just uh, uh, thank all the participants uh, to be for the interest in our uh, uh, days dedicated today to the ultrasounds and the application in organic synthesis and in general in process chemistry. Uh, but anyway, I just uh, ask anyone from the audience uh, for any uh, question to the speaker, please write a comment in the YouTube page. Uh, the question will be uh, forwarded to the, to the presenter at the end of the seminar. Uh, so I, I just want to thank today uh, the group uh, of Professor Giancarlo Gravotto from Turin, who is uh, uh, who basically helped us to uh, organize the, the, the day dedicated to ultrasounds that we present today. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this event will be uh, will be expanded into the real event uh, with uh, in do, doing presence, which was uh, actually scheduled last year before the just immediately before the, the COVID lockdown. Uh, so hopefully there will be a uh, the person the, the present meeting uh, aimed at uh, allowing the participants to be introduced to the techniques of microwave ultrasounds, but also to actually uh, utilize instruments uh, with a workshop in an afternoon session uh, that would allow the participants to actually utilize all the equipment made available in Torino uh, by uh, at the, the Professor Giancarlo Cravotto. So today we will have three speakers, uh, which I like to thank all of them. Uh, Pedro Cintas from Extremadura will be the first speaker. Uh, then Judy Lee from the University of Surrey, uh, the second speaker, and Professor Carlotto of the University of Turin. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Pedro, uh, Professor Cintas uh, from the universities uh, from the University of Extremadura. Universidad de Extremadura, actually, and uh, he has been uh, uh, developing his career beginning uh, as a student in this university, but then he moved after the PhD at University of Geneva uh, under the supervision of uh, uh, esteemed Professor uh, Pulser working on the asymmetric synthesis of amino acids. Uh, so when he finished this period, he returned and started his uh, uh, career first as a teacher, then as independent uh, professor uh, in the, at the Universidad of Extremadura. And uh, uh, he has been contributing in several uh, areas of organic synthesis, uh, 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 aiming his activities to uh, carbohydrate heterocyclic, heterocyclic compounds, uh, defining sustainable methodologies for their uh, synthesis and manipulation. He has been contributed for with over 200 publications, and uh, he is active also as an editor at the Visory Board of several journals, including ultrasonics, sonochemistry, and chirality. So today uh, he will talk about, uh, he will give us the first uh, uh, lecture, giving an introduction to sonochemistry and the role of ultrasound in green chemistry and green chemistry and synthesis. So Pedro, thank you again for accepting our invitation and uh, with the help of uh, Giancarlo, please, uh, uh, the stage is yours uh, for the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Luigi, for this kind presentation. Gracias mille for inviting me to talk about sonochemistry in the context of green chemistry. Perhaps it will be difficult to summarize the possibility of sonochemistry, but I'll try to provide some background and a few guidelines about sonochemistry as a green technology, while both uh, Judy and Giancarlo will be able to, to show 
the, the, the other applications much better than me. Okay, well, let, let's just see that. When uh, people hear the word ultrasound, probably a few things come to mind. For instance, in uh, medicinal applications, for instance, for diagnostics, also the underwater detection, the sonar, also the animal communication and the mechanisms of echolocation by bugs uh, on other mammals, but probably not specifically the stimulation of chemical reactions. Pedro, Pedro? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, you switch on, please, sorry. So, sorry, can, can you hear me again? There is a strong echo. I don't know uh, actually where it, it originates, but... Please proceed, sorry. Uh, at the moment, I don't know what to say. Okay, I'll try again. Oh. I don't know. Excuse me, I, I think there is a problem with the with the echo. Actually, Giorgio, they are all shut down, uh, they are all off. Excuse me. Can you hear me now? Pedro, Pedro, do you have the possibility when you touch the microphone, do you have possibility to select the different devices? No. Um, I see Pedro has two accounts. Has he logged in? Yes, twice? that's what I meant. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. In fact, I noticed it. There are two accounts. You are connected with two accounts. I don't know how, but you enter it, I think, with browser and with the app as an invite, invited. So you have two accounts, actually. Oh, sorry. If you, if you switch off the browser, any browser you have, if you can switch off and leave only the app or vice versa. I don't I don't see the screen. I don't see the screen, sorry. Luigi, as as organizer or or, or Giorgio, could you deny the access of one of the two uh, 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 access? I, I I will do. I I, 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 uh, I, I did uh, send. I okay. Now it's uh, the second Pedro has been uh, banned. So please try to talk again because I was trying to, but it didn't work. Can you speak, Pedro? Just to okay. Can Can you hear me again? Now yes. Now yes. Okay. Okay, I'll try this time. Yeah, please. Okay, I I continue anyway. Sorry. Now it's fine. Now it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Okay, there is a problem with the screen, but if you can hear me, I, I'll continue. It's okay? It's yes, okay please. for everybody? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Well, when people hear the word ultrasound, probably a few things come to mind. Uh, for instance, in the medicinal applications, also the sonar for other water detection, in animal communication, for instance, in bugs and other mammals. 
but uh, not specifically the chemical stimulation, the stimulation of, on an activation of chemical reactions. Uh, Giancarlo, okay, thank you very much. Just a minor curiosity from the PACS. It was Italian polymath Lazzaro Spallanzani, the, the first who anticipated the collocation mechanisms in, in bugs. Unfortunately, during the 19th century, paleobiology was dominated by other European scientists uh, who considered this uh, mechanism to, to make no sense. It took about 150 years when Griffith in the United States in the 20th century demonstrated that Spallanzani was, uh, was right working with dolphins. Okay, next slide, Giancarlo, okay. Okay, so chemistry deals with the fact that ultrasonic sound waves in chemistry. It's a general mechanism because if you know well, for instance, in photochemistry, you need uh, the chromophores and the groups activated by light. In electrochemistry, at conducting medium, electrolyte, for instance, and the microwaves, the dipolar species. But in sound chemistry, you only need a liquid transmitted sound. So in sound chemistry, there is an interplay between thermochemistry, uh, heating, and also the pressure effects after the bubble collapse. Next slide, please. Okay, the first question to be addressed is concerning the energy of ultrasound. In other words, is there any energy to activate a chemical reaction? Sound and ultrasound, of course, lacks quantum character. Uh, so there is no direct relationship between energy and frequency. In fact, the energy is uh, directly proportional to the to the amplitude, not the frequency. But if you compare the the frequency, for instance, the the, the megahertz region, the wavelengths are much larger than atomic dimensions. So there is no direct interaction between the radiation and and matter. So there should be a different mechanisms to activate a chemical reaction under the action of ultrasonic waves. Okay, this applies also for microwaves. This is the, the, the typical frequency of the domestic ovens. And in the case of microwaves, uh, probably most of you know well, there is no interaction between the electromagnetic radiation with, uh, with the matter of the atomic level. It's the electrical heating, uh, the mechanics that matters in this case is uh, the, 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 the electric heating is, uh, is the mechanism responsible for activation at the microwave irradiation. So in the case of so the chemistry, please, this is light. Okay, when a uh, liquid is irradiated with high intensity ultrasound, the intermolecular interaction are broken for a few microseconds and acoustic cavitation takes place. This is the formation, the growth, and the implicit collapse of bubbles. During the bubble collapse, intense local heating occurs and short waves emanate from the bubble rebound. Hot spots are created with extreme local temperature, about 4,000 or 5,000 Kelvin, and pressure in the order of 1,000 atmosphere, but with extraordinary cooling rate. In other works, cavitation is a quasi adiabatic phenomenon. Therefore, the kinetic energy release is enough to change materials both physically and chemically. In addition, at the extender surface, for instance, greater than uh, uh, 200 micrometers of 20 kilohertz, cavitation collapse is asymmetric and can generate a high speed microjet directed off the surface. This is responsible 
for the well-known cleaning effects and the erosion of surface induced by cavitation. Uh, the first time you hear about cavitation is hard to believe. How is it possible to, to generate this, this particular phenomenon? And is, is, uh, is the, the mathematics and physics we have cavitation is very complex, but it suffice to see that even in a modex ultrasonic uh, uh, bath, you can create for a few microseconds this high energy that is responsible for the activation of uh, chemical reactions. Please, next slide. Okay, this is the cavitational energy, not the, radi not, not the interaction between the radiation and matter with clips bonds, chemical bonds. For instance, in this picture, you can see the uh, sonolysis of water to generate the hydrogen hydroxyl radicals. And therefore, you can obtain, uh, for instance, uh, hydrogen peroxide. This is important for the typical processes of advanced oxidation processes to, to break uh, organic contaminants. So the fact you can obtain the hydroxyl radicals, you can detect, for instance, by the spectroscopic method and also the symmetric methods, and the possibility of obtaining hydrogen peroxide uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is the way the cavitation works. This demonstrates the power of cavitation to, uh, to induce the homolysis of chemical bombs and then the formation of new chemical bond. Okay. Microbubbles behave as microreactors. You can see the, the three typical reactions, the bubble interior with the extreme conditions, the interface where is the possibility of short waves, uh, short waves and shear forces, and all the, the liquid medium have room temperature. So the string condition in the bubble, also in the interface, uh, is, uh, is the region in which uh, most uh, hard condition be created to induce chemical reactions. Next slide, please. Okay, it's not easy to uh, introduce some guidelines about some chemical reactivity, but uh, in fact, some chemical reaction can be divided into three, three groups. For instance, homogeneous reactions following radical mechanisms or coordinatively and situated species, for instance, in the case of organometallics, these coordinatively and situated species play the same role or organic radicals in, or, or in, in organic, uh, in purely organic mechanisms. This reaction in, in this case can be activated by uh, the fed oxonication. In the case of the heterogeneous reaction following a polar mechanisms, probably there is not sonochemical switching, but there are appreciable mechanical effects. This is, for instance, emulsification and also in hax max and energy transfer. This is what is sometimes called false sonochemistry because there is no such change in the, in the mechanism, but also the mechanical effects are important for acceleration. And the third groups of sonochemical reaction are heterogeneous reaction in which there is the, the dual possibility of following a polar or radical mechanism. And the sonication, in many cases, the, the mechanism is switched to the radical pathway. So both in, in the case of, okay, please, okay. Both in the case of A and C, excuse me, Giancarlo, please, okay. Both in the case of A and C cases, there's the possibility of a true uh, a true activation induced by uh, ultrasound waves in terms of mechanistic, uh, a mechanism switching. Okay, next, please. Okay, 
that said, uh, is convenient to talk about uh, green chemistry in general with a critical view. This is a picture I, I like to, to put to my students, particularly put postgraduate students, because this, uh, this slide summarizes, for instance, the principle of reading chemistry, the safe solvents, the activation, and the lack of hazardous processes. Uh, the question is, OK, ultrasound, microwaves, electrochemistry, also photochemistry with, uh, with visible light, are green technology. Why? Because ultrasound and microwaves accelerate the chemical reaction, avoiding the formation of byproducts and also uh, the secondary not competitive reaction. But you should evaluate this with a critical view. For instance, consider a solvent-free uh, reaction activated by microwaves. This is green. It's okay. For instance, many uh, mechanochemical processes. But what about the World Cup? Next slide, please. Okay, the post-synthetic World Cup is, uh, you should think seriously about that because in, in many cases, the processes of acylation and purification require a large amount of volatile organic compounds, also chromatography and crystallization. So, it's important to, uh, to talk about microwaves or sonochemistry as enabled technologies in modern organic synthesis. But don't forget, you can evaluate the overall process. Next slide, please. For instance, consider the biomax valorization in which uh, the sugar oligomers can transform it in a useful symptom in organic synthesis. For instance, the hydroxyl methyl furfural, you can see it in blue. Okay, the transformation between the sugar, the sugar oligomer from lignin on from other polymers is necessary to transform this oligomer system glucose and then the interconvention, the isomerization in uh, uh, fructose, and then the conversion to the hydrosymethyl furfural. OK, you can do this daily transformation with, with the oligomers and the hydrosymethyl furfural, but of the green technology, for instance, the combination of ionic liquids with uh, ultrasound. But in some case, it's convenient to see it about the metrics. Metrics are important. And this is probably uh, the the take home message I, I I would like to to convey to 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 all of you is convenient to evaluate the not only the the e factors also the mass intensity the reaction efficiency and also uh, this is the uh, uh, Lavoisier number is a new metric introduced by John and Rouse from Canada, in which you can relate their, their lead with the atomic economy and also the molecular way. So, next slide, please. Okay, this is a table illustrating some common organic reaction. And you can see in many synthetically useful reactions, stratification, alkylation, epoxidation, uh, there is a large sex of reagent use. Okay, from the from the uh, from the viewpoint of yields and atom economy are pretty good. Okay, but if you consider the mass efficiency and particularly the mass intensity, excluding water, mass intensity is the ratio between the, the total mass of the reaction per the kilogram of product. The reality is different. This this value of the mass intensity or the max productivity is the inverse of the mass intensity, illustrate well the real situation. So, as uh, noted before, the most important is okay, you can use a microwave, ultrasound, 
Another important technology to activate the chemical reaction, but don't forget, metrics are always important, no matter the technique you are using to activate a chemical reactions. So, next slide, please. Okay, I would like to illustrate the advantage of ultrasound in that few slides. For instance, this is a epoxidation, consider a typical aldo reaction promoted by base in um, a green, green medium with the ethanol and water. And, okay, after the, the, the synthesis of the aldo product, there is necessary the elimination and there's a further oxidation to obtain the corresponding epoxide. Okay, this sequence can obtain it in a uh, left step with the aid of ultrasound, for instance, is the direct conversion between the, the starting materials to the final epoxide, only one single step using uh, uh, it's a one pod reactions. Okay, this uh, ultrasound overcomes multi steps. The reaction is greatly accelerated, but once again, the balance between plus and minus. Okay, no. Okay. A few slides before, Giancarlo. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Next. Next. Okay, this. Okay. No, no, no. Before, okay, the preceding one. Okay, this is another case of the ring clock synthesis conducted with ultrasound in water. This is a typical on water or in water re reaction. There is a good selectivity in the ring clock synthesis induced by the ultrasound compared with the even the solvent free reaction. The solvent free reaction affords a mixture of two compounds. So the once again the activation of the ultrasound illustrated that emulsification induced by sound waves in order to this is a reaction probably occurring in the interface, the bubble interface, and you are using an organometallic reaction, the crux catalyst to induce this selective transformation. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll continue with an on water reaction induced by ultrasound. Reaction are very selective. For instance, the, the coupling uh, in less, less time than the conventional reaction on the top and the bottom, you can see also one pot synthesis of the anticoagulant drug warfarin with a selling uh, in enteric sex. And this is a green synthesis anyway, induced by ultrasound, 10 hours anyway, but mild conditions. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a synthesis of the antitumoral drug cephalandol A. This is a typical on water reaction, also in the presence of ultrasound waves and pot synthesis. Chemical yield is very good. The, the, the mass efficiency is, is also acceptable, but consider, for instance, the mass intensity. The mass intensity is low. This means that most, most matter of this reaction is being waste. So once again, it's important to consider not only a green, a green synthesis, but also the metrics to illustrate the, uh, the balance between the, the chemical activation and the pluses of the chemical activation, but the product of an important target. Okay, I will show now a few slides concerning organometallic reaction. As noted before, these processes are important because the intermediacy 
uh, is involving the inactively unsaturated intermediates, display the same role as the organic radical in purely organic uh, transformation. And I would like to illustrate is the case of the uh, carbonyl iron lactons. He was pioneered by Steve Lee in Cambridge something ago, but that there are synthetically important. So you can take this unsaturated epoxide, versatile uh, reagents, to undergo transformation with these uh, iron carbonyls to, in, to induce the formation of these uh, stable crystalline solids with a uh, high atom economy. So this reaction has sluggish without sonication. The sonication in this case is one of, of uh, is key for the success of this transformation. Anyway, the subsequent transformation are not particularly green. I, I, I like to pull the, like, the slide in order to, uh, to illustrate the activation of ultrasound waves in the case of this uh, uh, organometallic intermediates, but consider, for instance, the first state is, con is carried out in benzene, it's not green at all, but this, this product is uh, sustained with, uh, with atom, with high atom economy, and um, it's instead for the synthesis or a uh, chiral compound in which you can create the pure diastereomer after chromatography. This is the, the synthesis of the malingolid uh, synthesis is present in, in this uh, blue algae. Next slide, please. Okay, this is another illustration of an important uh, antibiotic, the milbemycin, Peter one is for veterinary use in isolated for the streptomyces bacteria, is related to the abermectins, which had important antibiotics. And in this case, the first step involving the alkylation, as you can see, is the, the alkylation of the alcohol with subsequent removal of the uh, silyl protecting group. This first step fails without sonication. This is another point in which the activation of a chemical reaction and the heterogeneous reactions is important. Otherwise, you can, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to make this process without sonication. This is like. Okay, this is also an illustration of the key intermediate in the synthesis of ion, ion 4 antibiotic, that, uh, the tetron nosine. And this process is involving a radical intermediate with that generate with a organoselenin compounds. It's, it's interesting to, to know the, the, the strong acceleration, uh, acceleration caused by the ultrasound waves with a electron transfer reaction, uh, carbonyl compost equal to can octate, the corresponding uh, ketyl radical anion, and this, uh, this, okay, this achieves the synthesis of the selenium, the organ of selenium to induce this mild transformation. Uh, with the sonication, the reaction is very slow, as you can see, so this illustrates again the possibilities of performing a uh, synthesis, not always necessarily green synthesis, but chemical synthesis with uh, particularly the complex structure with uh, ultrasound. It's important also note that these chemical reactions are performed, were per performed with clean bugs with uh, low acoustic intensity. The low acoustic intensity is important to preserve the stereochemical uh, identity of this product in order to avoid other uh, side reactions, for instance, racemization or degradation of the products. Uh, in, in conclusion, there is a beneficial effect. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, I I like to to convey a, a, a series of positive effects. Unfortunately, uh, I have illustrated only uh, a few a few cases in in organic synthesis and the beneficial effects of sonication on chemical reactivities not only accelerate a chemical reactions, sometimes with the use of less forcing conditions, with the, the, the reduction of the number of steps required, very often multi-step reaction can, uh, can be transforming into, into a few uh, in a synthesis involving a, a few steps. It's particularly important in the heterogeneous processes uh, the, the improvement in max and energy transfers enhances the catalytic efficiency, and there is an enormous possibility to uh, to processes in which other technology fails. Particularly, the even if the 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 the, 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 the stream condition provided by by cavitation. In the bulk solution, this condition are mild enough to uh, to enable uh, synthesis in good chill and good selectivities. Okay, uh, the message is therefore thin Greeks consider consider the use of ultrasound in chemical transformation, but in any way, consider also the metrics. Metrics are important in order to evaluate the, uh, the greenness of the overall transformation. Don't forget mass and energy assessment. Okay. Uh, sorry, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, because uh, I have some echo, but I, I don't know if you have the same echo as as I have. It's OK. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, uh, well, of course, uh, there have been some issues, uh, so uh, I may check uh, and give a little bit of time if there is any question from the audience or from the colleagues. OK, please, uh, uh, Judy, if you. Uh, OK, Pedro. OK, uh, thank you very much. OK, excuse me. One second, please. OK, I, can, I don't check if there is any. Thank, thank, thank you, Giancarlo. Thank you, Giancarlo, for for help for your you, help. You, Pedro, you, for you, there is a question. Welcome. For you, there is a question from Luca Gianji, uh, and uh, he wants to know if uh, the ultrasound can be used to demagnetize, demagnetize magnetic power. Uh, if any other speaker could answer to this question. So he wants to know if you, you can use ultrasounds to actually uh, influence the magnetism of a magnetic powder. Oh, you, the magnetic power on ultrasound? Magnetic powder, uh, let's say a solid possessing magnetic uh, properties, if can be influenced uh, the magnetism of this powder? Probably, I, d I don't know exactly. You can use, for instance, a piso piezoelectric materials. Piezoelectric materials can be activated by the ultrasound. In the case of magnetic, uh, I don't know, because uh, probably uh, I think there is some bi bibliography concerning the use of for instance, magnetostic teeth materials, probably uh, magnetostic teeth materials can be activated by ultrasound. But um, I, I don't know, it's, it's the, I, I, I have no uh, 
information concerning this particular point. It's anyway. a very, in fact, it's a very specific field of application. This uh, uh, is in uh, uh, assumed, so maybe uh, worthy for further uh, uh, investigation on the literature. Uh, yes. So, Pedro, I just want to thank you for uh, uh, the presentation, and we may uh, move forward and uh, uh, leave the stage to Judy, Professor Judy Lee from Surrey. Uh, uh, Isabella? Me? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm I'll just give you the stage. Thank you. Uh, should, should, should I share my, so should I start now? You can start. I, I leave the presentation, the chair to uh, yeah. Professor Lancelotti. Yeah, you can share your presentation, Dr. Lee. Thank you. The and next presentation, yes, we can see perfectly. Okay. Can you see my laser pointer as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, also great. The pointer, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. The, the next presentation is uh, from Judy Lee, Dr. Judy Lee from the University of Surrey. Uh, she, she started uh, her activity at the School of Chemistry in 2006 uh, at the Melbourne University. After uh, up to 2009, she moved from uh, uh, to Japan, and uh, uh, up to 2015, she remains to work uh, at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And uh, from the 2015 up to now, she is a reader in chemical and process engineering at the Surrey University. The uh, research areas of uh, Dr. Judy Lee are uh, acoustic cavitation, ultrasonic processing synthesis, and membrane filtration. The last two uh, areas, in particular for uh, waste treatment, uh, recycling, uh, and uh, uh, in the area of uh, emulsions, nanoparticles, microsphere, etc. Uh, if you are ready, uh, we can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and the uh, opportunity to present at this workshop. So today I hope to give you an introduction on the state of art and application of sonar crystallization and the complexity behind such process. But before I begin, I just want to thank all my, um, just, uh, my collaborators and funding bodies throughout the years that contributed towards this work. Okay, so I'll begin with an overview on crystallization, how that began. And in nature, it really started off in the sea where the evaporation of the salt from the sea water on the rocks, as you can see in this image here, and then more human directed where um, humans took note of the nature evaporation process and um, begin to uh, construct evaporation ponds where they're able to uh, crystallize the salt crystals. And more recently with sonar crystallization, so this man here is Professor Alfred Loomis. He's a famous uh, sonar chemist. And one of the photo here that shows him in the lab, and I would like to think this beaker here is where he conducted some sonar crystallization, which is what he discovered and rep first reported. So first of all, I'll give you a background on crystallization. So crystallization, the applications are used for crystal production, separation and purification. And these processes are important in synthesis of chemicals. Uh, so the activity, the crystal, the product is important. And also in pharmaceuticals, which you may be more used to, where the, the product purity and um, quality is important and so is the crystal structure that forms the tablet is important as well. And lastly, um, one of the other applications is food. So this is uh, in chocolate as well as in butter or margarine. Crystallization is important because it affects the texture, the taste and also stability of the product. So in all these crystallization processes, nu crystal nucleation growth and breakages are important. So because 
nucle nucleation rate affects the time in which crystals are uh, produced, it affects the yield and it affects reproducibility as well. Similarly, the size and size distribution are important. Um, the morphology as well as if the size distribution is broad or narrow, that could affect the product quality. And more importantly, in pharmaceutical industry, so if, for example, paracetamol, polymorphism is important. So para paracetamol exists in the monoclinic, which is form one. This is stable, but it has a poor technological and biopharmaceutical properties. Whereas the orthorhombic, which is form two, it's unstable, not readily formed, but this is much better for tableting properties and it does not require any binding agents to be added. So this is the preferred form. And what's the mechanism behind um, crystallization? So with the crystallization process, it so if I have a concentration versus temperature profile, the solubility, so the saturation increases with increasing temperature. If we have a solute in this position at this temperature and that concentration is below the saturation, so you it will be it's undersaturated. So the supersaturation ratio is the concentration that it is in relative to the concentration at the saturation. So if it's less than one, it's undersaturated, and so therefore you have it in a dissolved form. If we were to apply cooling and hit the saturation, this is the saturation where beyond this we cannot dissolve any more solutes in there. So the supersaturation is one. If we continue to cool it further, where the supersaturation is greater than one, what happens is we're in a zone where crystallization can occur. But in order for crystallization to occur, it needs to overcome a certain amount of free energy. And that free energy is associated the phase, the energy needed to change the phase from the liquid phase to the solid crystal, and also the energy needed to create that surface there. So you can see there is a radius of the cluster radius there. If we were to plot the free energy, you can see that there is a maximum energy here that needs to overcome. And that critical radius here is associated with the critical um, energy needed to overcome that. So if if the cluster of radius is small, what happens? You tend to dissolve, and in order once it reaches the critical size, then it will grow to the size that is detectable by eye. And the time it takes for that cluster to reach a detectable size is what we call the induction time. So the nucleation rate, how quick the crystals are forming, is dependent uh, um, on the energy, on the temperature, um, and and also size of these clusters as well. And and the relationship between nucleation rate and induction time is inverse. So increasing induction time, so much longer, then therefore the slower the nucleation rate, the shorter the induction time, the faster the nucleation rate. So overall, if we're in the metal stable zone, what happens is the crystals will either dissolve all grow to a detectable size and all this is a probability function and when you're in the metastable zone this is what we call a stochastic process in the sense if you were to carry this experiment a hundred times on the same conditions it could crystallize in a few seconds or you could crystallize in a few hours or even a few days so it's a very it's a probability function and therefore um, there's a lot of um, issues associated with crystallization process and to be able to control it. And um, if we call it further, where the supersaturation is ratio is high, we get an unstable stone, spontaneous nucleation that occurs. So overall, if you increase nucleation rate, we have a shorter induction time and smaller crystals. And just to demonstrate the, the problem with metastable zone, if you're within that, is um, is this image here where we've got a super cooled water that's less than zero, so it's freezing. It's liquid in the bottle, but when it's poured out, you see the ice being formed. Similarly, this bottle here, um, Okay, the video is not working, but that bottle is a liquid water and when a shock is applied, what happens is that that then ice starts to propagate through the liquid because the system has been disturbed. So. Overall, the crystallization, you can have primary nucleation, 
where you have homogeneous nucleation where crystals appear, or if it's, it could be heterogeneous where you have solar surfaces, dust or presence of bubbles, for example, it could induce nucleation as well as if you lower surface tension, then you can induce crystallization. There's also the other um, nucleation called secondary nucleation. This is where existing crystals, where there is a parent crystal from the homogeneous crystallization or primary nucleation, or if you add specific seed into the system to initiate crystallization. So then with with attrition, abrasion or erosion of these parent crystals, what happens is that it then initiates what we call um, secondary nucleation from crystal growth or breakages, erosion from the parent crystals. So I hope you can appreciate the crystallization is a complex system, as well as you can have cooling crystallization, anti solvent crystallization, melt and also evaporation crystallization. So, Currently, the industrial crystallizers, um, you have a continuous sort of batch tank crystallizers, a large scale, but currently in the batch system, because you, the mixing is not well mixed with this, this reactor, you get a mixture of um, crystallization taking place and different nucleation rates. So now the industry are moving towards improving current um, crystallization by having a, a, a more reproducible product and product consistency. And this, they are moving towards what I call a plug flow reactors, where you've got a flow through re reactor in the tubular form. And this this allows all the crystals for a given um, point in time to spend the same amount of time and, and have same reaction time. And there is move towards um, microfluidics where you have crystallization occurring in the micro channel. So it's almost like a lab on a chip where they're crystallizing proteins in small amounts. So so the industry is now moving towards alleviate some of the problems experienced from traditional crystallizers, but acoustic cavitation. So sonication can help with some of the, um, the, the problems that have been encountered. And I'll give you a bit of overview on the sonication, um, the physical effects of it, and also on the sonar crystallization. So acoustic cavitation is a complex system. You've got bubble nuclei that can um, grow via this process called rectified diffusion and that can reach, reach a resonance size or they can coalesce to reach a resonance size but coalescence too much of it we get degas bubbles that gets removed um, from the system so when the bubbles at the resonance size what happens you can collapse very violently and adiabatically and it produces sonal luminescence as well as sonal chemistry as you heard before um, so when they collapse violently they can also fragment into daughter bubbles um, and, and act as a bubble nuclear all dissolve. So this is a very complex process. But while I'm describing this, I'm just going to show you there's actually a movie released in 1999 on chain reaction just center around the collapse intensity and about the energy that, that can be initiated. So this is a side note. Okay, so more on the sonal luminescence because this really um, um, tell us about the cavitation activity. So let me just show you how different ultrasonic transducers can generate a cavitation activity and the difference in the sonal luminescence. So this is the ultrasonic horn. Um, okay, my videos are not working. Okay, so ultrasonic horn and you can see the track transducers is here and the um, cavitation activity just below here and, and if I had the video you could hear the sound as well and similarly with the plate transducers um, you don't see the the, uh, the cavitation activity as strong but the transducers at the bottom and also when we have a high intensity focal ultrasound um, the transducer is concave and is focused at the center so this is more for medical um, targeted sort of um, application but if if we were to look at the sonar luminescence images, so the emission of light from the, the bubbles, collapsing bubbles, you can see with the horn is usually towards the surface of the horn and it's localized. And but with the plate transducer, it's much more emitted more radially. And you see the um the spatial distribution is more evenly distributed in the liquid above the transducers. And with the high foo, it's low, it's just before the um the focal point. And the reason for the 
only spatial distribution we see is due to the standing way. So if we have um, small bubbles, low frequency, and or we have reflective surface, what happens the sound waves travel to the liquid surface, gets reflected back, and all the cavitation bubbles are localized at the antinodes. If we have um, traveling wave where we have large attenuation of um, the sound waves from large bubbles or a high frequency, what happens is that the sound pressure waves is attenuated and when they get reflected you have the strongest standing way near the surface and therefore you push this active bubble to the surface. And the, 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 the spatial distribution of these sonar luminescing bubbles is dependent on frequency pulsing the, the, the gas gases and any surface active solely in, 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 in solution and power. And all this affects the spatial distribution and, and I just want to go through the, the complexity of acoustic cavitation and then so you can appreciate when we come to sonar crystallization why the system becomes um, even more complex. So if we look at the different frequencies, so these are the emission of light. So if we increase frequency, so you can see the change in localized sonar luminescence at the surface and also decreasing the intensity as well. If we're to look at if we have a take the 444 48 kilohertz, this is a free surface. If we're to put a plate on that surface and reflect the sound way, we get a much more um, larger spatial distribution of the cavitation activity. Similarly, if we increase in power, okay, so you can see the change in the spatial distribution and intensity, and also if we were to pulse, all this were continuous sonication, but if we were to turn the ultrasound on, off, and at a different, um, uh, pulsing at a different frequency, we see the change in the spatial distribution of cavitation activity in the solution above it. Similarly, if we have a gas concentration where we have 100% gas saturation, if we were to degas, we see an increase in sonar luminescence intensity and cavitation activity, but then decreases if you degas it too much. And if we have something that's surface active, then can go to the bubble surfaces and prevent them from coalescing. Again, we so this is water. If we in, if we add a sodium dusesyl sulfate, which is a surface active um, a solute, then we see an increase in sonar luminescence intensity. But if we add too much much, it decreases. So it's important when we apply an ultrasound to be mindful of what is happening um, to the cavitation within water because you can see it's quite sensitive to these sonication parameters as well as solution parameters. But what does this got to do with sonar crystallization? So let me just show you an image here. This is an anti-solvent crystal uh, system where ultrasound has been applied and you can see the crystal. So these are sodium chloride crystal that has been formed. And I hope you can recognize the structure there. You can see on the side, you don't see any crystal. So ultrasound, the transducers at the bottom. If we were to take the sonar luminescence image of that, you can see the cavitation bubbles. So there is a strong correlation linking the cavitation bubbles with the crystals that we see. And and we have a link correlation between the, the, the sonar luminescence intensity we can measure as well as crystal size. So this is for 98 kilohertz. In black, that is for sonar luminescence intensity as a function of applied calorimetric power. So you can see increasing in the power, we're driving the, the more cavitation activity, we have stronger sonar luminescence intensity. When we measure the crystal size, you can see the crystal size with increasing um, the sonar luminescence intensity, we have a decrease in the crystal size. So that's on the right hand side. This is the, um, the mean volume or well, volume mean diameter of the crystals we measure. And you can see when the sonar luminescence intensity doesn't change, we don't see a change in the crystal size. Similarly, if we look at the much higher frequencies, um, where higher frequencies, the cavitation threshold for the given power is higher. And again, when we have no cavitation activity, we don't see a change in crystal size. But as soon as we see an increase in the, in the sonar luminescence intensity, we see a decrease in the crystal size. So there is a strong link um, that cavitation activity is initiating the sonar crystallization that we are observing. So what are some of the positive effects that uh, we can see from, from the crystals? So you can see now that cavitation can reduce 
crystal size, but how does it vary as a function of different frequency? So this is a crystal, again, sodium chloride crystal, um, with no mixing and no ultrasound, and it's quite large. So if we were to apply an ultrasonic horn, so here in circle, this is um, no ultrasound, and this is the uh, volume percentage of the crystals as a function of particle size. Keep in mind the x-axis is logged, so you can see that the particle size without sonication or mixing is quite large, whereas when we apply ultrasonic horn, it's much narrower size distribution and also uh, it's smaller. If we were to apply an ultrasonic plate transducer, so this is the 22 kilohertz, uh, 22 kilohertz here. If we're to increase frequency to 44, this is the dotted line is 44 um, kilohertz. So you can see the crystals is much smaller as well, um, probably comparable to that of the horn. But if we were to increase the frequency further to 98 and also to 139, and so increase the frequency towards the one megahertz, the effect of ultrasound is, is less compared to the lower frequencies. And one might say the, the effect of ultrasound is due to mixing. So what we've done is we applied mixing with different um, RPMs, so rev revolution per minute. You can see increasing mixing. Yes, we get smaller size crystals, but if you look at the morphology of the crystals, it's not as symmetric as that of um, crystals generated by ultrasound. And that tells us that ultrasound is affecting the, the more the primary or secondary new more the nucleation of the the um the system that is different to the effect of mixing so and the optimum frequency we observe is around about 44 to 98 kilohertz for for optimum crystal production uh, reduction but you can see we could control the crystal size by changing the frequency or changing the power as you saw before and just to give you evidence of nucleation rate. So this is where we applied ultrasound to um, saline dairy whey. So this is whey is from cheese manufact uh, manufacturing. So this is the liquid you see. And when concentrated, you can concentrate the protein as well as the salt, and we can crystallize those products. Um, and if you can see here, the crystallization is be detected via turbidity and with no ultrasound, it takes about three hours before crystallization to, to occur. Whereas if we were to apply horn for the first, first 20 seconds, what we see is crystallization actually occurred much sooner than um, compared to without ultrasound. And this is an hour. So an hour versus three hour in an industrial point of view could cost, a, could save the company a lot of money by increasing the nucleation rate. And so uh, just to illustrate that ultrasound can increase the nucleation rate. Similarly, with the polymorphism, so I mentioned about the paracetamol that has application in the pharmaceutical industry, how this orthorhombic form two is desired. And what we found is that in the absence of ultrasound, so no ultrasound, we don't get any of the form two. So we don't see the form two. So normally in industry, they may have to add certain additives in there to induce the formation of form two. But we found by applying ultrasound, the different frequencies again, and with different power, we see the increase in the percentage of the form two. So this is the desired. And you can see the long sort of needle-like paracetamol that can be that, that are formed from sonication. And we do see an increase in the form two production by increasing power here. But again, as we've seen with the previous crystal size, the 98 kilohertz of the lower frequency is more effective compared to the higher frequencies, which the effects decreases. And um, so ultrasound is very um, selective, can selectively generate the desired um, polymorph. Similar, so if we were to take a closer look on the cause, so we know that um, ultrasound can reduce induction time. This is the time in which um, we induce nucleation and when we start to see the crystals. So if we were to plot all the induction time from the different powers and different frequencies against the percentage of form two, you can see there is roughly a, a, um, a, a lin almost linear um, um, correlation where if we were to reduce induction time, 
time. So increased nucleation rate, this gives us um, a, a higher formation of the form two. And if we were to optimize this, um, people have reported, you can just simply, we can get a large percentage of form two as opposed to the form one and simply by, um, by applying ultrasound. So keep in mind, normally the form two is unstable and are not readily formed. And also with sonication time, um, all the experiments I showed you before is when ultrasound is uh, applied continuously throughout the crystallization um, time. And so if we were to monitor the time, because we could shorten the amount of ultrasound that's applied. So under silent condition, um, you can see the crystals are increasing in size. So this is average crystal size as a function of crystallization time. So if we were to look at the SCM, images, you can see the crystals are getting bigger and we get the sort of the stepwise um, formation that we see without stirring. And if we were to apply ultrasound, you can see as a function of time, the crystals remain really, really small. OK, this is this size are comparable to the size in the first five seconds. So this tells us we don't need to sonicate throughout the whole duration of um, crystallization process. And simply in this example, five seconds sonication is sufficient to reach pretty much the minimum in size um, that, that we, we get uh, from compared to a 90 second sonication. So, um, so again, just reiterate only five seconds sonication is needed to reduce the crystal size to the minimum size. And, um, and now I'll give you a closer view of what happens in the micro channel because there are more and more moving towards sonic applying crystallization in uh, micro channels. So here I've got images of the um, the the, the channel here and ultrasound is just below. Um, this is final images where crystals uh, appeared. So just to give you an idea, initially at time zero, there's already some, some large bubbles there, but when we turn the ultrasound on, you can see, so I want you to just focus on this region because eventually whatever the bubbles are doing here is leading to the crystals here. So when they turn the ultrasound on, the, the bubble expands, the bubbles will cavitate and these bubbles have come together, collided, moved away, but it takes some time because of induction time for us to, to see the crystal. So you can see outside here, Super saturation have been initiated, so we don't see crystals out where you don't see any bubbles because crystallization is slow. But upon the collision of the bubbles with time, we see the crystals appear. Although it seems to be clear that these bubbles are generating crystallization, but if we show, sorry, I've um, if I show you another example where we've got these two bubble here where there's no crystals, so if I again to frame one. If I just show these two bubbles, they're moving, okay? They're moving, they're not colliding, but this region here, we don't see any crystals, but we do see readily when cavitation bubbles come together, we form crystals. So this just shows not all cavitation bubbles leads to sonar crystallization, and there's something behind the mechanism that at the moment we, we still don't quite understand. Um, so, so some of the, but what, because of from the benefits we already observe, um, it, it, there are crystallizers being built and, and some companies are using these. Um, so here I've got an image of this has got 40 transducers. And so this is these is this probably report in 2005. And you can see um, 40 bonded transducers and this is a 20 litre flow cell. Similarly, um, uh, the, this is a lot earlier where they have a, a um, ultrasonic. So you can see um, there's probably one, two, there might be another one of our ultrasound um, transducers bonded around that cylinder. And how this is used is that um, you've acts like a seed. So you've got like normal CSTR or the continuous batch reactors, are sh uh, continuous stirred uh, batch, uh, reactors uh, I showed you before. So what happens is, is a continuous loop. So you're drawing the, the solution. It, it's get fed through um, this uh, reactor, so sonicator, and then it gets sent back almost as if it's acted seeding in the whole process. And similarly with the move towards, you know, micro channels and microfluidics, people are exploring using ultrasound to initiate crystallization as we have a flow through continuous system. 
So although these are the current development, but as I show you before, we are now trying to understand what is happening. Um, although there are benefits, there's also discrepancies in the literature. Um, people have shown ultrasound actually increases induction time. So this is on amino acid with the horn and cooling crystallization at low supersaturations. They are finding the induction time here actually increases with increasing ultrasonic energy and then it decreases this is when um, ultrasound energy e exceeds a certain threshold. So this differs what I was showing you before where crystallization is increased, the nucleation rates increase, but here is showing the opposite. Similarly, others uh, have shown that at high frequencies in this example, that increase in power actually, in so the y-axis is average crystal size and x-axis is a function of time. So they're showing that the crystal size actually increases increases with the increasing time and also increases with increasing power. And this is with glycine. And, and I hope you've noted that I've always talked about what the, the system is, what kind of ultrasound frequency and, and the system, because all this is important, as I showed you before, it affects the cavitation activity. And also variation with power. These are two graphs here that show the y-axis is the natural log of the induction time and the x-axis is one over natural log squared of the supersaturation ratio. So the left and the right is of the same um, plot of the x and y-axis, but it's of a different system and they're showing different behaviors. One shows that the, um, the gradient with increase in power is parallel. There's no change in gradients, only the intersect changes. Whereas in another system, they're showing the gradient changes. So there is still a lot that we, we don't know why there are differences in the literature, but overall we, we do see benefits, but it's important to know um, there are discrepancies in the literature that shows another behavior that we need to take care when applying ultra sound. So so to just to, to recap in the complexity of the system, I mentioned about the, the crystallization here and the nucleation rate. So nucleation rate is affected by the temperature, the supersaturation ratio, the surface tension, as well as pressure, and all these solvent and solid types, how the supersaturation is generated, whether it's cooling crystallization or anti-solvent, any impurities whether you're cooling or heating rate, mixing, spatial or time variations in, in, in which the material, the, the, the solutes are being mixed, and also the reactant geometry is important. Similarly with ultrasound, you know, you heard about with the high temperatures and high pressures and, and the conditions in which bubbles are cavitating. And you heard about the, the, the fluid shear, the jetting and the shock waves that you can observe with different bubble dynamics. And I hope I've shown you about the variation in sonar luminescence intensity and the spatial distribution of these. All this cavitation activity is affected by all the parameters I've listed here. And for ultrasound, it's, it's additional parameter are the transducer type frequency and power. So all this combined, it makes sonar crystallization a very complex system. And that although we see the benefits, it's very difficult to um, find out the exact mechanism that's causing these. And so the take home message I want to leave you with is that um, Sonar crystallization is a complex process because both ultra acoustic cavitation as well as uh, crystallization is complex. And we may see the benefits, but a full understanding of the mechanism still eludes us as it depends on the, the crystallization and sonication conditions. And there is scope to further improve current industrial crystallizers and realizes full potential and efficiency. Um, so with this, I just would like to, you know, thank the organizers and also thank you all for your attention. And, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Judy Lee, for your interesting presentation about uh, sonar crystallization. Any question from uh, the colleagues or from the audience? Perhaps no, uh, no question at the moment, up to now from, up to now from the audience. I'll be happy to take any questions that would that that comes later.
Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can move to the next presentation, I believe, but if later arrived some question, they are uh, welcome. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Okay, so good afternoon. Let's move to the next um, uh, contribution from Professor Cravotto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I can hear. I cannot hear you. You have the microphone off. Yes, yes. Perfect. Ah, okay. oh, yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can share your presentation, please. Um, Professor Cravotto, after uh, four years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, got a position at the Department of Drug Science and Technology at the University of Torino, uh, where he is now, he's now full professor of organic chemistry. Uh, he is author of about uh, 440 scientific papers, 20 patents, 40 book chapters, and uh, is editor of seven books. Uh, his important activity in the field of green organic synthesis has been recognized in 2018 with the, uh, the Scientific Research Award Organic Chemistry for the Environment, Energy and Nanosciences. And in 2020, he has also been awarded um, from the Italian Chemical Society of the Gold Metal Paternò. So um, the stage is yours. Uh, with a contribution about cavitational, cavitational technologies. Please, Professor Cravotto. We, we cannot hear you because you have the microphone uh, off. To do first and then okay, activate. Now, yes. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Well, now I, I move again to the screen. Well, okay. Close it. Thanks. Well, let's start again. So for me, it's now relatively simpler. Uh, after such brilliant presentation of the two colleagues, Pedro Sintas and Judy Lee, uh, they actually prepare the field. Now I have only to play with some application, but of course they uh, really shed light in such complicated, as you say, and, and not so common field, uh, that is the field of sonochemistry, ultrasound, cavitation. I move a bit wider in the concept of cavitational technologies that uh, open the door also to uh, other way to generate uh, cavitation uh, and some current apl uh, applications. So we have fortunately several books. Uh, I had the pleasure also to share with, uh, with uh, Professor Pedro Sintas and with Jean-Marc Levesque and uh, Francois Delattre, uh, this uh, recent uh, we edited this recent uh, um, yeah, short book uh, in, in terms of uh, information that shows challenges and perspective. What, what we have to intend for cavitational technologies? So for sonochemists, uh, sound waves uh, uh, levitate chemistry. We, we can say in a, in a, in a direct way, as you can see in the picture, or in a more holistic way uh, in which uh, we have several advantages, as already shown by the two uh, uh, estimated colleagues, the, the, the huge effect on chemical reaction in green, on green chemistry and also in downstream, large, uh, such as in the uh, control uh, crystallization. Well, here is, is uh, extremely spectacular to see uh, the, really the levitation of little droplets or light uh, material. Ultrasound also technically uh, can be uh, uh, generated by different type of uh, uh, 
pulsing heart that are the more common piezoelectric uh, with the transducer, with the piezoelectric disc or, or rings mounted. And so we have experiences for years. I bought a piezoelectric ring, disc, and then to the thanks to the collaboration with uh, two good friends, we could uh, build by ourselves several uh, devices, several prototypes, or magnetostriction. Uh, another way to generate uh, ultrasound, uh, particularly useful for big scale application uh, at the industrial level. Uh, a common picture from our laboratory of uh, several devices uh, with uh, different frequency from 20 to 500 kilohertz, and also some cooling system to keep uh, to control the temperature, in particular for sonocrystallization. Well, this is a typical horn with the, uh, the, the, the booster and the horn that move down and, of course, with some theory uh, to build a, a, an effective and, and uh, reliable and robust device. Then there are no limits in, in scaling up. You see here a, a, a three meter long uh, <laughs> horn for application, and you see the cavitation all, uh, all along the, the, the axis. Uh, I have to highlight uh, the relevance of uh, cavitation measurement. There are um, different types uh, are available on the market uh, of uh, cavitometer. Uh, and even if we don't have the unit to measure cavitation, uh, at least the number that you see uh, reported, that so the conversion of mechanical power to electrical uh, number, uh, conversion to uh, an electrical value, you see uh, below in the cone of uh, a powerful uh, uh, titanium horn, you see uh, 137 and moving right, uh, uh, we have a, a, a powerful butt with the with, with, in the bottom, we have a, 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 a booster with, with, a, with a, a, a transducer. On the right, we have a common uh, cleaning bath in which uh, simple transducer, simple piezoelectric ring are glue on the bottom of the emitting surface. So you see very different number from 6 to 137. The other way to generate cavitation is with the hydrodynamic cavitation, with the hydrodynamic units. And here you have represented the, the, the figures of uh, typical venturi tubes uh, with circular shape or slit venturi. The other way is with orifices, with a different shape, with one holes or, or several holes uh, in, in, the, in the surface in which uh, uh, of course, the liquid is pumped through, is pumped or is also in suction, it depends. So, well, as you can see here, in, in, in this area, in the blue area, due to the restriction uh, and the, the increase of the speed, the blue area here, uh, in, in this area, you see in the bottom a very low pressure. That means that from here, we can, uh, in such a low pressure, generate bubbles, and then bubbles move uh, through the, 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 the restriction, and this bubble grows and then suddenly collapses. The collapse of bubble generate microjets and a number of other physical and chemical effects already described by Professor Sin. Uh, a very little system for hydrodynamic cavitation in which, oh, sorry, again, um, the, uh, this restriction enabled also to observe uh, the, 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 the effect and the generation of bubbles in a very little volume under control. Of course, then you can move in a bigger scale on the left, uh, uh, some photo in our laboratory and some other for industrial application. So in particular, in the field of water treatment, hydrodynamic cavitation with the working in with the concept of uh, venturi tube or orifices is extremely efficient. And uh, there are really many applications because it's also you can also have a, a very low energy consumption. Uh, 
it means that it is really an environmental friendly uh, techniques for treat uh, water uh, at different level of uh, biological or, or chemical uh, pollution. In the last 10 years, uh, much has been done in the direction of uh, rotor, stator, hydrodynamic habitation units, uh, because it opened the doors also to the application of hydrodynamic habitation in case of uh, uh, solid material in suspension. Uh, that is almost impossible if you have very, very little, very tiny uh, orifices that could be, of course, blocked by uh, the flow. This is an example of, uh, of, uh, of system in which you can also here in the new version open the cavity in which you have the rotating system uh, that enable to pretreat biomass or any other uh, dense uh, material for several applications for um, food industry, for cosmetic industry and so on. So very wide uh, exam number of, ex of application. Uh, in the last few years, uh, uh, several of this uh, equipment works worldwide in the pretreatment of biomass to produce uh, uh, methane, produce biogas, uh, increasing the efficiency and reducing the, 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 the time to be to the induction time to far for in the in the following uh, uh, digestion. Uh, in anaerobic condition for the production of biogas. So it uh, increased the production and reduced the, the time for the, the work of the bacteria. Well, some words about current applications of both ultrasound and hydrodynamic cavitation. Uh, I would spend uh, hours, so of course I try to concentrate uh, uh, the example in, in in, in the direction, so in the in the field in which I observe uh, really much more examples at the industrial level. And for sure, uh, at least uh, since uh, 30 years, uh, we have companies that uh, exploit uh, ultrasonics uh, to improve, to enhance the extraction of plant material in food or in, in phyto extract. This is a typical uh, setup uh, for the industrial uh, extraction. You see here uh, the place in which you have the application of uh, emitting plates and the generator connected outside. And internally, we have always a stirrer, a mechanical stirrer, and uh, you see here for, well, this is uh, for, for, for at least 20 years, it was a, 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 an excellent way to accelerate the, react, uh, the, the extraction, but uh, the intensity, so the energy intensity uh, is in, in such big volume, considering the only the short, uh, uh, distance that can, uh, the, in which the, 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 the sonication occur inside of the liquid, of course, is, is not really an efficient way, in spite of the, the steering, of course, but well, the, in the density, the power density is relatively, is very low. Or, uh, 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 this means that extraction take uh, hours instead of minutes or seconds. Well, we can also see that uh, uh, there are also big scale application, but uh, more and more uh, extraction uh, has been also performed in, uh, in uh, under exploiting. So rotor stator systems, you see here a photo in our laboratories. Uh, we see also Giorgio Grillo in the back and, and uh, <laughs> working in the extraction. We coupled also the uh, hydrodynamic cavitation, rotor stator, with a, a conventional system that uh, has several transducers, so ultrasound and hydrodynamic cavitation. At the region, a few years ago, it was in an or, almost horizontal way, then we move uh, uh, in, in a vertical that we will see. So, uh, 
ultrasound and hydrodynamic habitation besides extraction are very, very common in food, uh, food industry for processing. You see here a, a, a recent book that described the design and optimization uh, of this type of application. And uh, I am pleased to start with the, 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 the system developed by the Spanish company uh, that, uh, um, and also in the Institute of Physics, uh, in which uh, in particular uh, the colleague Gallego uh, work in the development of this type of plate that, that help to, to destroy the foam in, in, in a millisecond. And this type of device or new generation of this device are also applied in, in the pharmaceutical industry, in particular in the field of fermentation, in which foam is represent often a, a problem. Food cutting is very common. There are several companies that have a huge market because with ultrasonic you can cut everything, so you have no limit. Moreover, uh, the, the blade, the ultrasonic blade, is uh, uh, avoid the risk of contamination. So no bacteria, no fungi, no yeast can grow on such vibrating surfaces. Ultrasonic welding and sealing, extremely common as well. No other way are uh, respectful for the food contained in the, in the tetra pack or in any other kind of, uh, of bags uh, for salad, for juices, and so on. And moreover, you avoid to, to burn because the closing with heating, of course, has a tremendous side effect on the quality of the food contained in the, in the, in the, in the, in the packaging. Homogenizer, everybody know the power full effect of ultrasonics to, to generate emulsion. Uh, I am pleased to go in back in the a bit is an historical application of uh, this ultrasonic homogenizer in this resonant chamber in which uh, the, this very uh, narrow orifice is coupled with this uh, vibrating blade to prepare an uh, extremely stable emulsion that everybody know uh, and everybody had uh, in in uh, own uh, uh, kitchen. Emulsification, of course, is also related to the acoustic power, but in the same time also by frequencies. You can generate uh, a milk working with uh, 20 or 30 or 40 kilohertz and then increasing progressively the frequencies. Uh, you can have a, a smaller and smaller droplet uh, and in the end almost you can have a transparent solution if you have a, a little uh, percentage of uh, oil to be dispersed in water, uh, but you have to repeat the treatment with uh, at different uh, uh, frequencies. Meantime, uh, as uh, Judy already said uh, regarding uh, the collapsing droplet, uh, stationary ways can be extremely useful to uh, enable the separation of oil from water. Uh, we, we recently experimented a, a new device, ultrasonic device, to be applied in, in Mediterranean country to produce uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, the only one step in the production of extra virgin olive oil is the malaxing, uh, that is batch. All the others are in flow, uh, uh, but the malaxing take at least half an hour, but it could be one hour or even more. And so uh, the, the producer need to have a, a battery of several malaxing unit to enable to proceed with the production. With the ultrasonic in this way, uh, directly uh, the system was mounted in, in, in flow and the, the olive paste was uh, treated with ultrasonics and directly uh, uh, moved to, with the pump to the decanter and immediately uh, the separation. So it's a, a very efficient way to, to increase the productivity of oil from olive. 
few years ago, we were working also in the field of, uh, of milk uh, for the milk treatment. And the idea was to, to act directly uh, from, from the production and then the transportation from uh, the milking station, uh, the treatment with hydrodynamic cavitation just only during the transfer in the, in the tank. Uh, and then repeating when uh, uh, the, the deli during the delivery of the milk for the production. Uh, the system was uh, competitive uh, to produce fresh milk with uh, because the reduction of uh, so the inactivation of, of bacteria was quite efficient in order to have a fresh milk with a longer shelf life. That means instead of two, three days, uh, at least one week. Uh, with, the, uh, <laughs> with the calcium caseinate, uh, we could also prepare some uh, uh, polymeric film. So in the direction, in the field of uh, milk derivatives, uh, some uh, film and also in some waste, uh, in the in, uh, industrial waste, of course, if you have a clean uh, caseinate, uh, polymerized with the, in the presence, of course, of ultrasonics that avoid the presence of the, of uh, bubbles in the in the in the polymer. Uh, it is also feasible the polymerization with typically with glycerol, also with some waste, industrial waste, of course, then is not so transparent. You see a, a dark color. There are other uh, uh, equipment applied at industrial level in food industry in particular, in which is, there is a mix of uh, share, so high share homogenizing effect and also cavitation. So based on the speed of the rotation, uh, you have both, you can have both effect. And there are big uh, food industry exploiting this rotating system that generate, of course, cavitation. Well, in the end, perspective, what we are expecting for the in the third millennium and now in the next decade, in my opinion, the flow, all the industry are looking for to move from batch production to flow mode uh, processes. And, uh, and we have been involved for synthetic application and also for other processing uh, with several types of equipment. We see here the engineer Cesare Buffa that collaborate with us uh, for many years. Now he is considering retired, but sometimes some help is still, uh, <laughs> so he remains uh, sometime available. Uh, we, we produce this multi-horn system for flow treatment. And then other little device to prepare data for the scaling up, uh, first in glass, in Pyrex, uh, in order to see what happened. You see here that the ultrasonics uh, occur are from the bottom for the emitting plate, as well as uh, from the horn. There were, this synthetic process is extremely exothermic and uh, these two uh, reagents were rapidly mixed. So the first uh, few centimeters were for just for mixing and then the reaction was very fast and with a peristaltic pump we could uh, successfully perform the reaction. And then moving from to the uh, titanium unit to to have all the data for uh, the scaling up uh, and to increase the productivity. Then in the market, of course, there are many other systems. Uh, this is from Cinetude, uh, from France, uh, several systems to, to, uh, to perform chemical reaction or to make some uh, uh, transform chemical transformation uh, working in flow mode, in loop or in flow mode. And for, again, for the extraction, uh, in the last few years, we did a lot of work, uh, both in plant extraction, as well as in biomass pretreatment with, in ultra, with ultrasound, in collaboration with Weber uh, in Germany. Uh, and this unit enabled 
to work uh, uh, also at different frequencies. So here in the first unit, you can have in, at low frequencies, you can have very, very tiny uh, holes uh, in, in, the, in the biomass, in plant material, and then in the second, you can accelerate the osmotic process then to higher frequency. We can play it also at 100, 120 uh, kilohertz. And again, always a protagonist, uh, Dr. Giorgio Grillo, again here operating with a, a big unit. Uh, in this case, it was three kilowatt in um, in the treatment of biomass within a, a European project, in which uh, we we show that our pre-treatment uh, with ultrasonics is uh, ex is much more in terms of also of calculation and life cycle uh, LCA uh, uh, calculation, the efficiency, a higher efficiency compared to the benchmark that would be uh, the, 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 the typical process like, uh, like uh, uh, process uh, uh, use uh, as a benchmark in, in, in the field, like the explosion, uh, which is here is the advantage is that is working in flow. So the expectancies are working in flow. Another system applied at the industrial level, uh, uh, developed also by other engineer uh, of the Polytechnic of Torino. And here, an, a device, a, a patented device, uh, uh, with uh, several uh, rotors. Instead of one simple rotor, you have here uh, uh, three rotors in which you, you divide a turbulence area in a high shear cavitation stage. This means, based on this shape, the, the rotation generates cavitation and turbulence, so combining high shear and turbulence. But the main uh, relevant aspect is that this device uh, enable a counter-current uh, uh, process. This means that in the extraction, typically you reach the equilibrium. In this case, the solid material is moving in one direction and counter current, you have the liquid. So this means on the right, you see that the equilibrium uh, can be reached much in much, much shorter time. It is much more efficient. Of course, is a, this particular setup uh, enable to the plant material to, to move always in the direction of clean solvent. Another uh, expectation, another uh, uh, improvement is also in the exploitation of uh, hybrid techniques. Uh, it's a long history, almost 20 years ago, we, we were working the combination of ultrasonics with microwaves in, in loop. So the, you see a horn that could activate the catalyst and the microwave oven to accelerate the reaction. Uh, also together with the with the professor Pedro Sintas, we, we developed several devices and we experimented several reactions working exploiting combination of ultrasonics and, and microwaves. And, uh, and uh, as you can see here in this device, uh, uh, also Maria Jesus that will tell uh, also a short lecture later, could prepare uh, some uh, nanoparticles and exploit it in the in a high, very efficient catalysis. Uh, another hybrid technology that uh, I would highlight again, mainly for water treatment, is the combination of uh, hydrodynamic cavitation with, with atmospheric plasma. By changing, so with the electrical discharge that you can see here in the scheme, uh, we can uh, have a huge advantage in the selection of the electrode uh, moving from carbon, from silver, from different type of electrode, you can uh, um, improve certain specific effect that could be uh, for biological inactivation of microorganisms or for water treatment to reduce COD or DOD. This is again uh, uh, also a short film that shows that 
powerful, such a powerful system to generate cavitation. Another example that unfortunately so far is not yet uh, in flow is the combination of uh, ultrasonic with, uh, uh, with uh, supercritical or liquid CO2, depending on the temperature and the pressure, to enhance uh, the, what is, the, the, again, the equilibrium, the, the process, the, the rate of extraction. This is the new setup of our new device uh, that combine, uh, again, the combination, because the efficiency of supercritical carbon dioxide is a bit limited by the time, because uh, the, the extraction rate is relatively slow, it takes time, and of course, in particular for decaffeination, uh, the typical process lasts at least uh, in big scale, industrial scale, 11, 12 hours. And uh, working with the Arabica and with the Robusta is even longer. So this means that decaffeination and many other um, applications combining the two techniques could be extremely uh, uh, profitable. Well, I am concluding now uh, with this uh, old picture that I share also with, with uh, my friend Pedro Sintas, uh, chemist in high energy microenvironment. Is a picture inside of a microwave oven of a non-metallic horn enable us as a chemist, as a solo chemist, that we hear a music in ultrasound. Normally people that know are not a <laughs> common to, to perform reaction in ultrasound are only disturbed by ultrasonics. For us it's a bit different because when you have a, a good sonication, it's like a music. It seems strange, but uh, I think that all the, 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 the co-worker and, and student uh, work in our group say, oh, well, it's sonicate very well. So it means that it's like a music. Different when you have not a good dissipation of wave, and so it, it's like a noise. But a good sonication is like a music. So thanks to all for your kind attention. Well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting overview of the potential and applications uh, of uh, these uh, techniques, uh, in particular for biomass transformation, maybe where the pretreatment is a, a, a really key step uh, would be uh, interesting to see the future applications, of course. Uh, if um, I think that we have uh, no questions from the audience. Uh, Giorgio didn't tell me anything about this. So uh, feel free, of course, uh, to ask uh, some more questions uh, in, the, in the next uh, time. And so we can move to the next presentations. Okay. Thank, you Thank, you. Much. Thank you very much again, Professor Cravotto. Um, I leave the microphone to Alessandro. You have the microphone off. We cannot hear Sorry. you. Sorry, thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, everybody. So we can now move to the, the last section of this uh, workshop that is dedicated to the contribution of um, the young scientists. The first one is coming from the um, uh, University of, of Turin, uh, Department of Chemistry, uh, with the Maria, Maria Jesus Moran Plata. I know that, uh, that my pronunciation is, is it's not It's okay, correct. it's okay. <laughs> but, okay, it was just an word. Okay, so we are, okay, Maria is going to, to talk about uh, ultrasound assisted nanocopper catalyzed transfer hydrogenation. So we are looking forward to hear your, your music. Okay, so please, Maria, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So hello everyone. 
Uh, so my name is Maria Jesus. I'm coming from, from the Department of Chemistry in the University of Turin. And before I was working in the Department of Drug Science and Technology in the group of Giancarlo Cravotto. And first of all, I would like to thank the Italian Chemical Society, uh, the group of Green Chemistry for giving me the opportunity to present here today my work. So uh, the title of this talk is Ultrasound Assisted and Nanocopper Catalyzed Transfer Hydrogenation. And uh, uh, the talk will be divided. I don't know, it's not, okay. Uh, so the talk will be divided in the following points. So a small uh, introduction about the use of ultrasound as green energy source. Then the synthesis of copper nanoparticles assisted by ultrasound irradiation, followed by the influence of sonication in the reaction rate and the kinetic study. Uh, and then the use of non-conventional energy sources for the transfer hydrogenation reductions. So uh, let's start with the introduction. So as we all know, uh, chemical and pharmaceutical industries are now facing serious environmental problems and though green chemistry during the last year has been widely developed as a new concept to to guide the expansion of more, uh, more sustainable synthetic methodologies. So among these new technologies, there is the ultrasound that is known to improve the reactivity and the kinetic of some processes through the formation uh, of cavitation bubbles, uh, growth of the bubbles and collapse. Uh, releasing a large amount of energy and so inducing localized stream uh, conditions of high temperatures and pressures, leading in this way to interesting uh, physical effects. So nowadays, sonochemistry, as we have uh, already seen, um, is widely used in the pretreatment and conversion of biomass, uh, also for cleaning, in chemical synthesis, for the removing of uh, dissolved gases from liquids and as we will see today in the production of copper nanoparticles that uh, then will be used in uh, catalytic synthesis. So um, uh, first of all, uh, what we did was the synthesis of copper nanoparticles taking into account the literature and the copper was dissolved in uh, water using uh, glycerol or ethylene glycol as a stabilizer so and a capping agent. Uh, then it was a stirrer and uh, the sodium uh, hydride hydroxide, sorry, was added until a pH of uh, 11, so a basic uh, solution. Afterwards, uh, the sodium borohydride was added and the solution was irradiated with uh, ultrasound for 20 minutes. And here we have the copper nanoparticles that were synthesized. All of them uh, were detail characterized um, using TEM, using SEM, and also the, the corresponding uh, nanoparticle size distribution was performed. Uh, as we can see, um, most of the particles have a diameter between 8 and 12 nanometers and a core shell morphology. So in the core, there is the, um, the copper zero and an amorphous uh, glycerol shell. So then uh, the size of the copper nanoparticles was determined using a laser diffractometer uh, to the freshly prepared nanoparticles that are the one here shown with oil bath. So the freshly prepared nanoparticles and after applying 10 minutes of microwave and 10 minutes of ultrasound. And as we can see here from the graph, the particles became more little when we applied the, the ultrasound. Um, then the kinetic study was performed in order to assess the influence of the ultrasound sonication on the reaction rate. And the nitrobenzene reduction to aniline was chosen as the model reaction and it was carried out under, under optimal conditions 
in presence of the freshly prepared uh, nanoparticles that are the one uh, shown uh, here in the graphs with uh, pink color, so without any ultrasound pretreatment, and uh, also with the presonicated uh, copper nanoparticles. As we can see, uh, the reaction was performed in conventional heating, so in a heating in the oil bath, then under ultrasound irradiation, and then under microwave irradiation. And as shown in all cases, uh, the ultrasound pretreatment clearly had a significant effect on the reaction rate. Um, so then this methodology was applied to two different hydrogenation processes. First, First of all, uh, we have the hydride free reduction of aromatic nitro compounds, and then uh, we will talk also about the hydride free selective reduction of alkynes to alkenes. So let's start with the nitro reduction. Uh, the reaction conditions were firstly optimized in terms of the copper source, uh, the base, and the reducing agent. And um, so the copper source, we can see here in the graph that, that the copper powder, so the copper zero, was the one working better. And then when studying different reducing agents, we were very happy to see that uh, depends on the on the reducing agent that we were using, we were able to be selective to different re uh, reduction products. Mm. So uh, the the, the reaction, sorry, was then uh, once it was optimized, um, it was performed for obtaining the, the fully reduction product. So in glycerol at 130 degree, we were able to fully um, reduce the nitrogen to the amino compound. Uh, and then uh, in ethanol amine, at 55 degrees, we were able to be selective to the ATSO compounds. Uh, so once they were uh, fully optimized, the reactions were performed in conventional conditions under microwave irradiation alone, under ultrasound irradiation alone, and with the combined system that seems sim system, sorry, that the professor Giancarlo Cravotto said before, the combined system of microwave and ultrasound irradiation. And as we can see, the use of the non-conventional techniques uh, reduce the reaction time in all cases. Uh, then a high number of uh, amino compounds and a high number of ATSO compounds were isolated with good yields. Okay. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, we were able to reduce the reaction time from one hour in conventional conditions to only 10 minutes under the combined system, and in the case of the ATSO compounds, from 25 hours in the conventional way to just one hour. And now the, the second uh, reaction that we perform is the selective semi-hydrogenation of alkynes to cis alkenes. And this reaction is usually uh, classically performed using the Lindlar catalyst that uh, usually suffers from over-hydrogenation and isomerization, low tolerance uh, with other reducible groups, and the presence of uh, lead. So in this case, we developed a high dry free selective uh, reduction of alkynes to the cis uh, alkene using the copper nanoparticles as the catalyst. So first of all, as in the other case, we did the, um, the reaction under different copper sources, different hydrogen sources, different bases, and once we have the optimized conditions, we perform the reaction under the conventional uh, steering and conventional heating and using the microwave and the, and the ultrasound. As we can see here from the, from the graph, 
uh, the ultrasound working alone is not able to complete the reaction since it needs a very high temperature of 150 degrees. So uh, by itself, it's, it's not able to reach that high temperature. Um, however, if combined with the microwave, we can observe a big decrease in the reaction time. So the microwave alone, uh, it takes around 90 minutes. However, when combined with the ultrasound, uh, it takes only uh, around 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so we demonstrate uh, that the, uh, the very important role of the ultrasound dispersion of the particles would increase the, the rate of the catalytic reaction. Uh, then a wide uh, range of cis alkenes uh, with different substituents uh, was were isolated, uh, showing the versatility of the of the process. Um, so, in summary, uh, Cooper nanoparticles have been obtained uh, under ultrasound irradiation, and afterwards, uh, an efficient and selective. A procedure for the transfer hydrogenation of aromatic nitro compounds to amino compounds <laughs> and to azo compounds was developed, as well as the selective reduction of uh, alkynes to cis alkenes. Uh, ultrasound uh, has shown uh, to play a very important role in uh, dispersing uh, the copper nanoparticles and so increasing the, the passivation, increasing the catalytic surface area uh, and so decreasing the energy and the time consuming. So thanks a lot again to the Italian Chemical Society for giving me the opportunity to present here the work and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maria, for your nice presentation. It was a great job. Congratulations. And unfortunately, we don't have any questions from the audience, but I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm really curious to know if, if there is any rationale in the choice of the hydrogen source to drive the reaction selectivity, or is just uh, and error. Yes, so we believe uh, that the um, glycerol and tyrene glycol uh, are able to form like kind of chelates. Okay. That are able to fully uh, reduce the um, the nitro compound to the amino compounds. Okay, so yeah. okay, so this is interesting. Yes, we tried different of them. Then for sure, also the um, uh, the temperature in this case plays a very important role. Uh, since for the fully reduction, we need to to perform the reaction at 130 degrees, and in this case, as we can see, the ethanol amine that is the one that then we use for the fully um, selective reduction to the azo compound at 130 degrees. We, we can see here a, a mixture of, of, uh, reduct, uh, of reduction products, but still we can see that the ATSO compound is quite selective. I mean, that we are not fully going to the amino compound that it happens in the ethylene glycol and in the glycerol. And then reducing, reducing the, the temperature that we can see here in the next slide at 55 degrees, we were fully selective. Sorry, because of the small time, I couldn't. Uh, no, no, it's fine. I couldn't really, yeah. Okay, so this is a good uh, result because uh, it's not so easy to achieve selectivity in this kind of reaction. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so Maria, uh, we can now move to to the second speaker and the last speaker of this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, Dr. Federico Verdini from uh, again uh, University of Turin. Uh, his talk uh, is about uh, the moving from batch to flow, so it's about process intensification of polyphenol ultrasound assisted extraction from grape stock. So, uh, Federico, uh, okay, so you are ready? Okay, so okay, we can see your presentation. So the floor is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, everything is fine. Thank you. Yes, I am uh, Federico Verdini, and uh, I am uh, a PhD student in biomolecular and pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Turin. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the committee that gave me the opportunity to be here to present uh, the work entitled From Batch to Flow, Polyphenols Ultras and Assisted Extractions in Water from Grape Salts. But what are grape salts? Salts are a solid residue or a solid waste obtained during the winemaking process, which is uh, graphically summarized in this slide. But in particular, salts are obtained after the first unit operation called the sending crushing, which allows the separation of grapes that are sent to the ferment from the salts that are recovered from the opposite side. Uh, in general, salts make up about 50% of the total winemaking solid waste, both for uh, white and red wine and the remaining part of uh, waste is mainly composed by grape marks. As a lignocellulosic biomass, grape salts are mainly composed by cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin that could be isolated or extracted uh, from, uh, with the use of ultrasound from the same biomass and further converted uh, towards platform chemicals. But grape salts are also composed by organic compounds which can have beneficial effects or influence on human health, such as triterpenes, sterols, and polyphenols. Polyphenols are secondary metabolites uh, whose monomeric and repeating units can be classified as follows. They could be phenolic acid, such as gallic acid, for example, but also macromolecules such as flavonoids, for example, catechin, porcinidine, and quercetin, but also non-flavonoids compounds. Here, I just reported an example of uh, polyphenolic composition of grape stems. And you can see that what the main uh, components of grape, grape, grape stems were quercetin, catechin, and capteric acid. But why polyphenols uh, have beneficial effect and influence on human health? Because they possess antioxidant activity. They are able to prevent cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes and they are also involved in the reduction of cholesterol levels in the human blood. The aim of the work was uh, the scalability of lab-scale ultrasound-assisted extractions uh, to um, a flow-through ultrasound cell reactor with a single capacity of 15 liters. And we also performed conventional extractions to verify the efficiency of the ultrasounds uh, to enhance the extraction yields, um, and in particular, Moreover, at the end of each treatment, a total phenolic content analysis, which is a colorimetric method, a spectrophotometric analysis, uh, that allows us to uh, rapidly assess the extraction yields of various treatments. Moreover, a pilic method was used to evaluate the uh, kinetics of ultrasound assisted extractions, and in particular, for the uh, extracted compounds uh, from lab scale ultrasound assisted extractions. A UPLC Easy MSMS analysis was performed to identify the extracted compounds. So, first of all, um, we explored and we performed a screening of lab scale ultrasound assisted extractions in batch approach, uh, exploiting an immersion horn. And these experiments were performed both at room temperature and at 45 degrees. And as you can see in the reported table, the higher TPC value. Uh, was obtained uh, for a sonication time of 45 minutes at 45 degrees, sonicating about 7.5 milligrams of physically sieved salt. Uh, these results uh, allowed, allowed to perform different extraction, always at lab scale and batch mode, uh, exploiting a cup form. And uh, in this case, uh, we obtained the highest yield, uh, which is uh, about 32 uh, milligrams of recovered phenolic compounds per grams of biomass. So, obtaining this information, we wanted to transfer them. No, sorry, <laughs> I, I just reported here uh, the kinetic equation and the kinetic models that were evaluated and calculated uh, by the uh, application of Peleg method. And uh, in the upper side, I reported the kinetic curves of ion experiments at both temperature and as you can see. See the iron experiments uh, conducted at 45 degrees cubes, it's very, very similar to the one uh, obtained uh, with the exploding of sea horn. Moreover, I reported the result of the UPLC analysis, and as you can see, we found that 
uh, the excited compounds were uh, in particular oligomer of procyanidine, quercetin, catechin, and gallic acids that are the same compounds or almost similar compounds uh, to, to the ones that I showed you in the, the previous slide. So obtain this information, we wanted to transfer them to a flow through ultrasound cell reactor, but to exactly reflect this information, uh, we suspended two kilograms of stalks into 60 liters of water uh, heated at 45 degrees, and this suspension was recirculated inside the system uh, for a total time of 120 minutes. And as you can see again, uh, the TPC value obtained at the end of these uh, scaled up ultrasound assisted extractions was 32.60 milligrams of uh, extracted phenolic compounds per grams of biomass. Again, I reported the, uh, the equations, the kinetic equation, and the consequent kinetic model. But we also want to concentrate the crude liquid uh, at the end of the scaled up ultrasound assisted extraction. So we exploited an industrial decanter, which allows the separation of the solid suspensions uh, in, present in the, the crude liquid. And after that the operation, we exploited a nanofiltration membrane skid, um, always in a recirculation mode, uh, that allows to save about 80% of water that could be, for example, reused for further extractions. And as you can see here in the reported graph, the, the global concentration reached values of 350%. But uh, the most important thing here is that at the end of the nanofiltration uh, treatment uh, that lasted 5 to 50 minutes, we obtained very similar TPC values, the one for both uh, scaled up uh, extractions and batch uh, lab scale ultrasound assisted extraction. Here, I uh, just reported the comparison of the results, and in particular, on the left side, I reported the three kinetic models uh, evaluated through the Peleg method. Uh, kinetic curves are uh, very similar, uh, but the unique difference is um, it is at short times for the scaled up model, and this uh, um, less steep curve is due to the fact that uh, the flow uh, ultrasound cell reactor was used in a recirculation approach. But again, uh, through the uh, Peleg Newton and evaluation of the kinetics, we were able to calculate the maximum extraction yield. Uh, and in this case, for the scaled up uh, extraction, we obtained this uh, highest value in absolute uh, compared to the other ones. Uh, on the right side, I reported the TPC values obtained both for, from ultrasound assisted extraction and conventional extractions. Uh, in general, we can say that in this case, ultrasounds enhance the extraction yield, except for the hydroalcoholic conventional extraction. But in this case, ultrasounds allowed to avoid the use of big quantity of ethanol that are uh, commonly used for this kind of conventional extraction. So again, in conclusion, it is possible to say that uh, ultrasounds assisted extraction can be transposed for the gram to kilo scale uh, with limited losses in terms of yield. Uh, again, the uh, nanofiltration member speed concentrated the crude liquid, setting about 80% of total water. And uh, at least uh, ultrasounds enhanced the conventional extraction yield, except for the hydroalcoholic one. And thank you for uh, your kind attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Federico, for the night presentation. Um, I guess we don't. Uh, okay, <laughs> George just confirmed me that we don't have any questions from from the audience. Just a, cur a curiosity. Probably I missed the point uh, during your talk. How do you how you do you how do you set the the flow rate uh, of your uh, flow process? So what is the rationale again for the choice of the flow rate when you scale up the process in uh, in, uh, in the flow mode? Yes, uh, we um, performed other experiments uh, and other topics with uh, exploring the same uh, instruments. And uh, we um, set it the flow rate by uh, the use of a pump, uh, which uh, helps us to set this value. And in particular, we uh, didn't perform a screening of uh, flow uh, rate inside the system uh, because, uh, as I said before, we used almost the same uh, flux and flow rates inside the system. Uh, obviously, a, a screening of this um, flow rate system could be, and in particular, a screening of flow rate values 
uh, could be um, evaluated for the prospective future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, questions from the committee? I don't, okay, no questions, so, okay, no, there is a question, no. So I think, Luigi, that we can conclude uh, this uh, workshop. Yes, thank you, uh, Alessandro, for taking care of this last session. And uh, uh, I just, uh, um, on behalf of the, co of the group, of the, green, of the Green Chemistry Group of the Italian Chemical Society, I just want to thank the, uh, the speakers, all the speakers, uh, and uh, of course all the chairmen and chair ladies who uh, assisted and then supervised the session. Uh, basically, um, uh, I just uh, uh, invite you for the next last uh, day, next Tuesday, dealing with the microalgae as a source for chem bio from chemicals. And uh, uh, just wish to thank again all the speakers and uh, uh, if uh, all the others may switch on the camera, uh, I just uh, um, wish you uh, a good evening and uh, see you next Tuesday. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you, Giancarlo. I don't see you. No. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye